so good afternoon everybody and this is wonderful to be amongst this industry cohort of leaders and professionals and i was listening earlier to lots of deliberations on stage and we are at a very interesting point in our sectors and india's journey mckinsey has said that this is not india's decade this is india's century because if you look at what's happening to us you know the debate today is are we going to grow 6.8% or are we going to grow 7% while rest of the world is saying hey is there going to be growth at all within the next 25 years one fifth of the total global workforce is going to be indians and a very interesting thing is also happening that in the last 10 years 85 million people you know which is more than the population of germany have moved into our cities and my daughter was asking me she said dad if that's right you know why don't we see that because all those people look like you know you and me if they were like germans you know we would be saying hey there is a major demographic shift happening and within that our industry is at a point which is probably you know once in a lifetime opportunity and if you see india today our share of tourism earnings both for the country and the share for the world over the next 10 years is supposed to go 5x so we are at this very interesting take off point and if we see the last 3 years 15% supply which would have come into the markets didn't come in courtesy the pandemic another 12% supply got erased from the market across different price points so 27% supply which should have been sitting with us is not there and demand in our market grows at a secular 4% so effectively we've had if you were to extrapolate the impact of the pandemic to today we've had 27% supply go off and a 12% addition on top of that there are 2 and a half crore indians who travel out every year and the good thing is that not more than 60 lakh have done that so 1.8 crore indians are within india who would have gone out and what's further encouraging is that they take two breaks a year with their kids now we have exposed their kids to india so why these are all excellent portents we have come out of a once in a lifetime black swan and let's not forget those learnings and i am very happy to bhuvnesh and to bw to have put this very eclectic panel of leaders here and between these four leaders and their portfolios they manage and provide leadership to 16000 rooms across 183 hotels across the country they employ 17000 people and i am like you looking forward to hearing and learning from their insights so please join me in giving a big round of applause to all the four leaders on the panel and without much ado i will first immediately go to somebody you know who spent his uh, formative years he spent his formative decade with oberoi hotels you know operating from sri lanka sorry to srinagar to baghdad before the 90s he decided to make park his home so vijay i wanted to ask you you know your portfolio is 23 hotels today another 16 hotels in the pipeline and brilliant focus on uh, you know entertainment and fnb in the portfolio and one of india's home grown bespoke portfolios you know which are designer you know in quality 
what have been your top three learnings coming out of the pandemic? Okay, thank you. And uh, thanks for getting me here. Uh, firstly, taking on from uh, what uh, Rajiv was saying, I think uh, the first thing is it's uh, time to celebrate rather than, I, I'm not sure if it's time to learn. So uh, I think currently uh, Indians are celebrating uh, festivals like never before. Indians are celebrating weddings like never before. Indians are traveling like never before. And travel and tourism is booming like never before. And we can look forward to some golden years ahead for travel and tourism. Some of the other important things which are happening at the moment, of course, is that they talked about employment in the previous session. Actually, 6 million jobs have got added over the last year or so from when initially there were 40 million jobs, we dropped down to about 29 million jobs and now we are back to 35 million jobs. So 6 million jobs have sort of come back. So again, it's a reason to celebrate. Also reason to celebrate is that the hospitality industry is going to add another 24 million jobs over the next five years. Another good point as far as the golden years are concerned is that this industry is going to grow at a rate of seven and a half to eight percent over the next five to ten years. So that is also on the very, very positive side. Now coming to the learnings, I would say there are five key learnings rather than three, which, uh, which, which have been learnings for us or it's for the industry as well. Number one is that uh, most importantly is that resilience and agility uh, leads to the creation of a stable and also of a formidable organization. So the first thing is that the learning has been that you have to be a resilient organization and you have to be a strong uh, agile organization and it leads to the creation of a formidable organization. The second key learning for us has been that low probability actually does not mean low risk. Uh, as, as we would have seen, uh, you know, at the beginning of this year, it looked that the, uh, there was no chance of a Russia-Ukraine war, but that does not mean that there was no risk. So it's not just important to just have a success plan or to have a plan A and have a plan B. It's equally important that you also have a survival plan always in place. So low probability does not mean low risk. And currently the low probability is in terms of say the South Asia crisis, everybody thinks that it may not happen, but so if it was to happen, what is the survival plan which we need to have? The third thing is the third learning is not actually a, a, a sort of a learning. It is my belief that in a crisis or in a bad market or in a difficult situation, there will always be one company which will out, outperform the market. And we took upon ourselves that we would be that company which is going to outperform the market in terms of uh, the margins as we go forward. And we are very happy to say that we were able to achieve it. Uh, fourth, uh, fourth learning, I would say, is in terms of decision making. Decision making in difficult circumstances has to be always ahead of the curve. You can't be behind uh, in taking uh, decisions. If you have to reduce cost or you have to defend your revenues or you have to take decisions in terms of going forward, decision making always has to be ahead of the curve. And lastly, the key learning has been in terms of that people actually make the whole difference. Uh, the teams make highly engaged teams, create highly engaged customers, and those teams only lead to higher profits and higher results. Now, coming to the first one, which is in relation to resilience, developing resilience is not an easy task. It's, uh, it's also very difficult to sort of define and also very difficult or harder to do. Uh, the first in terms of uh, resilience is to build financial resilience. And uh, it, it's very important for companies who have, and all of us who have gone through this crisis, and I'm sure this is the key learning that you have to have a very strong capital position. And the second most important thing is that you need to have uh, 
definitely in terms of liquidity, you should have significant liquidity uh, so that you can overcome, you can distinctly overcome any kind of a decline in revenue or in terms of overcoming any kind of embedded cost you have or any kind of credit losses you have. So the first thing is in terms of financial uh, resilience is that you have to have a very strong capital position and you need to have significant amount of liquidity to overcome a crisis. Also, uh, as we went through the crisis, we saw that it's exceedingly important to reduce cost. And uh, reducing cost means that you have to manage costs better than the competitors. And again, we were able to, during the first year of the pandemic, we were able to reduce cost by almost 52%. Uh, we were able to reduce payroll expenses to the extent of 41%. We were able to reduce heat, light, and power expenses by almost 42%, and 60% reduction in direct costs, leading to the fact that in the pandemic year, we were EBITDA positive. There were only two companies which were EBITDA positive. If you were to look at the listed companies, and I'm, uh, uh, that one of us, we, were not, we are not a listed company, but we were EBITDA positive. The other companies uh, among the four listed companies, they were minus by 24%, by 59%, by minus 17%. Uh, and of course, there was one ahead of us, uh, which is on the panel by 24%. So the key thing, of course, is that financial resilience is exceedingly critical to come out of the crisis. You need to have a strong capital position. You need to have uh, a, a excess amount of liquidity to overcome this. Uh, we as a company, that is the APJ Srinandra Park Hotels, have always maintained a, a very uh, healthy debt to equity ratio. We have always maintained it below one is to one, and that also significantly helped us. And all throughout uh, the period of the pandemic, cash management was exceedingly important. We were looking at cash management on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, and also on a quarterly basis to see that there is a, a definite amount of liquidity available to overcome the crisis. Fantastic. 40% reduction in operating costs, day-to-day -day focus, you know, on cash, actually looking at your cash roster every day. So uh, brilliant takeaways and also being very conservative with leverage and key resilience lessons of resilience and both agility walking hand in hand. Now I turn toward a young gentleman hotelier and I think uh, during the pandemic, it's been not only a professional training, but also a mental makeup and backgrounds that have given leaders a resilience edge. So this gentleman, he was actually his formative years. He spent in the Middle East before coming to India. Uh, Nikhil today runs a portfolio, which is uh, 56 hotels, another 25 hotels in the pipeline. 8,000 people, uh, 1,000 crore plus top line. What's very interesting is I recently read his book, which is 4.6 on 5 on Amazon. Uh, it's uh, Kabir and Rumi Consulting. So his father likes Kabir. And I think courtesy the time he spent in the Middle East, Rumi had an influence. So you should check it out. And he's written about spiritual lessons as a toolkit for operating in the corporate world. But that's on a different track. Okay, Nikhil, if, if I look at the pandemic and the lessons, what is it that you are doing to give Wyndham roots in India? How are you helping it grow? What have been the lessons that have impacted your drive and strategy for growing your portfolio in the country? Mr. Pandit, firstly, uh, thank you for the introduction. And uh, I must uh, congratulate uh, Bhuvanesh and Team DW for making this uh, reunion of uh, ex IXCL and ex uh, elementary colleagues on, on one panel. So it feels uh, fantastic to be uh, on the same panel with uh, Vikram and you. Well, I think, uh, and, and we heard that a little bit earlier with uh, Mr. Thakkar and Mr. Pakaya on franchising and uh, 
Wyndham is uh, the largest hotel franchising company in the world with uh, 9,057 room hotels right now in 95 countries. Uh, we've stuck to the guns of franchising in this part of the world. Um, one of the things that we tweaked, uh, and you heard of third party uh, being large in, in US, we've been successful in implementing third party operators with us for owners that actually want it to be managed. So I think one of the success mantras has definitely been the engagement with third party owners. Uh, the second has been the owner first mentality that we've had and we've ensured that we walk with the owners every step of the way in the last two years, whether it was cost reduction, whether the unfortunate um, staff replacements that, that happened. But what we did do as an organization is we took it upon ourselves to try and place these personnel in other industries. So that's something that actually stood by us um, in, in the long go. And, and we have employees who have actually come back to us today and saying they would rather work with Wyndham uh, because they saw the human element in the last two years. And, and last piece that I would like to speak of, I think, uh, and you defined this in the previous organization, 500 pin codes in India. I think every brand can actually expand to the 500 pin codes in India. And that's really where, where we want to go. Wonderful. So if I read between the lines, you are saying your growth strategy, especially with franchising, is not just the metro cities, but also the tertiary cities. And I think this has been a very interesting recurring theme, you know, whether we were listening to the earlier panel on ESG or, uh, you know, listening to Ajay and uh, when he scored a century, I actually sent him a message to say that, hey, you know, you become the Tendulkar of the sector. But uh, his response was quite kind and humbling. So very interesting that you are wanting to drive this big localization for a global brand by looking at this pin code strategy. Thank you. Now I want to turn to another panelist uh, who's actually a non-hotelier. Uh, he's an historian. He's a poet at heart. Uh, between him and me, I think the difference chronologically is of a generation. If I see his interests and, you know, his intellectual capabilities in a different domain altogether. He's been a founding member of Intac. He has co-authored and written 14 different books and tomes on history, culture and art. And in my mind, sometimes, and this I have not told Laman, <clears throat> that uh, if, let's say, God was to say what should be an alternate profession for Aman Nath, I would say make him a doctor. The reason is people read history and some teach history. He breathes life into history. He has taken ailing dilapidated structures, forgotten structures, things that people thought were relics and has not only infused life in them, he's made them so strong that today they share this spirit with everybody who touches, stays and engages with them. So if he was a doctor, you know, surely, you know, I would be very happy to say, you know, put my appointment there because if somebody is ailing, you know, then go to Dr. Uh, Amannath. So, and uh, today under Neemrana, he runs a very uh, delectable portfolio of 17 unique properties and he's involved in curating another three and bringing them to life. But with this background and the fact that, you know, you never studied hotels to start off and that you look at things through, so 360, and if you look at history and your lessons from history, and I was speaking to Aman earlier, he told me something interesting. He said, well, I focus on my core principles. It's better to stick to the knitting. So I want to understand from Aman, what are those core principles that have helped you not only survive and thrive? Thank you. Thank you. That was a long introduction. 
I'm also very impressed with uh, your memories, both of you, all of you actually, with the amount of statistics that you can remember. I was told that you should eject statistics from your mind so that you can put something else into it. So I eject them immediately. Um, I think the question you ask is not difficult for me because um, I'm an intuition person, uh, intuitive person. So if you remain honest to your core values, which for us is history, the history of India is our greatest trump card. So why would we go out emulating the West? I find that the hotels in India have for too long and perhaps still continue to look at an alien role model. People come to India to see the difference. We've got to give them a hotel that doesn't look like I don't want to take any names, look like their hotels. So that lesson is coming through now. So if I think you're honest, your core values, and I'm more than a um, non-hotel hotelier, we've never taken a loan. Now that sounds very unconventional to people. And we've done gigantic projects. So when people are talking about cutting costs, We've never let the costs rise in the first place. So I think that if you remain um, alert, intuitive, youthful, flexible, lean, all the things that you know managers teach you, but you should know them yourself as an Indian, you know, we are a very austere nation. And austerity in India is a virtue. It's not a sin. So why do we venerate Gandhi more than the richest person in India? Because less has always been more. So when you get into this escalation race that such and such brand has done a five star, so I do a six and I do a seven, I think you are core values of India. You're forgetting why people come to India. They do not come for excess. There's enough countries, you know, who put soap on their body and rub their body on you and give you a massage. In, that's not India's image, you know. So we really have to go back a bit. It's all wonderful that we talk statistics, we are management people, we understand services, we understand hygiene, but we've forgotten India. And I think Nimrana never did. So uh, after the pandemic, I think uh, if you know the statistics, you must know better. But we were among the first group to really swing back and get figures better than before, but almost immediately. So when people say, how is it possible? I, I say, how is it not possible? Because that's the only way I see it. You know, I'm, I'm an optimist in that sense. And every time you're challenged, whether by the government, or local authorities, people, whatever, you know, you, 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 you have to come back because you, your core values always remain the same. So when you're saying employ local, I mean, that's the first thing we've always done. And I have, um, I think very differently, which is evident, you know, when you're talking about schools for uh, ho hotels, I think we should have vocational training institutes. And I have been uh, telling different governments, you know, I even named one institute uh, called AFBP. So which stood for Artvi Pass Barvi Fail. Because if you look at the people that the hotels employ, especially outside the city or in the city, you know, most of the people are done 10th, 12th, so on. And that's the majority. The management people you're talking about are somebody else. They've already got a better education if they've been to you know, a public school or they've been to a great college. They don't even need to go to a hotel airing institute because your common sense is uncommon by then. So if you have to drive people with an uncommon sense and the Indian hospitality within you, which is deep rooted, you cannot even push it out of you, you know, I'm talking of an average Indian and a rural Indian, then the two of you make an extraordinary mix, you know. In Rajasthan, nobody will hand you a glass like that. They will hand it to you like this. You don't teach them. I think you learn from them. So I think rather than make your people 
feel that they are misfits when they come. You know, if you go to Shekhawati, you, you, you learn a lesson of hospitality, you learn of humility, you learn of, you know, just something which cannot be taught. So I think that the people here should be learning from that lot rather than giving them a complex So, you know, instead of saying good morning, sir, at five o'clock in the evening, you know, why can't people just do namas namaskar, namaste, whatever, you know, the obra has started, you know, that whole process. Now many more hotels do that. I think I've digressed from your question, actually. You didn't digress, you know, I, I was all ears and it's so beautiful. My, and I must thank you Aman for that. My takeaway from hearing him is to say, let's all be students instead of trying to be teachers. And there is so much in our country, you know, let's make that a position and let's position that right. And Atvi Paan's Barvi fail is going to remain with me. So on a similar track, uh, Vikram Lemontree has 87 hotels today, another two dozen in the pipeline, 6,500 plus people. Quarter one was 200 crores. Yeah. It's listed, so you won't say what the closing figures of Q2 are. But if I was to add uh, the new Orica at Bombay, which is at 669 keys, would probably be India's largest inventory single asset property. Then the company is set on target, you know, to cross a uh, 1000 crore plus run rate. But given this background, and we were hearing in the morning about people, and Aman very interestingly said, instead of trying to fight the war for talent outside of the communities, how do we co-opt the community and learn from the community? While he may have been successful, I think the big grouse of the sentiment has been that as a sector, the sector did not really deliver trust in the human capital during the pandemic. So, what do you think? Why did this happen? And more importantly, what do we need to do now to atone for that and make up for that rapidly? Thanks, Rahul. Uh, and it was lovely listening to all the panelists. I think what's happened has happened. We as an industry didn't take care of our people, period. Whatever it may be, these were reactions on the spur of the moment. We didn't know what hit us. We didn't know how to react. We didn't know better. The question is, how do we get those people back? The question is, how do those seats of those hotel schools fill up? I'm, I'm told 60% are empty today. What do we do to get them back? What do we do to those employees who are working in the industry today? How do we keep them motivated? How do we keep them happy? Now, that is the question, if you ask me, Rahul. Uh, see, the easy answer is, say, increase salaries, but doesn't work that way. You know, margins won't support it. Business won't support it. And in the end, we are in a business. You know, when you talk to hotel companies, they often talk about a new model of, you know, management contracts where they say, let's share uh, with the owner. Let's take more of the upside and reduce our fixed. I have a question here for everybody. Have we ever looked at it in a way that we say, let's share with our employees? Vijay spoke about healthy GOPs. We've declared a EBITDA margin of 48.2%, which I think was the highest in the industry, at least among the listed players. Margins across the board are expanding. Margin across the board are healthier than ever before. These are at least 30 to 40% higher than the same numbers pre-COVID. And this is true for brands across, listed, non-listed, hotels across, business, leisure, everywhere. Have we ever looked at saying, listen, let me share my margins with my employees. Let that general manager who's effectively the CEO of that hotel, does he get a stake of this enhanced EBITDA margin, which has come because of various cost cuttings that we've done we, with all our learnings? Have we looked at it that way? The answer is probably no. If somebody has and can put up their hand, I'd be very happy to you know learn more and hear that person here. But the fact is we are still looking at employees in the old fashion, in the old way of looking at things. And I think that's not going to work going forward. That's not going to get more and more people 
to join and i can see natwar agreeing with me so natwar <laughs> so that's that's one very important thing and that's a very different way uh, that we all as an industry need to adapt to secondly boss you know what's going to happen is that when you go to hotel schools and by the way this is something i learned from rahul when he and i used to do recruitment for lemon tree 15 years ago and you know his his one talking point which still stays with me is when he would go to these hotel schools and say that in a lemon tree in 7 years from an associate you become a general manager back in the day the hierarchies were not there the structure was very flat and you could actually become a general manager today you know uh, for an associate to be a general manager he'll probably be as old as me eh? and that definitely is not attractive enough for guys to come and join this industry so in my view i think it's about showing growth promising growth delivering growth uh, and that will make these guys join the industry come back to the industry and you know find us attractive all over again yeah so that's my two bit rahul thank you that's a, a very invigorating idea and i must tell you about vikram that uh, he was not always an executive he is actually from the northeast and uh, his uh, family had a hotel in jorhat it was called the great eastern but uh, courtesy the alpha and the sulfa he decided to move and join the mainstream but the ideas of you know actually co-opting employees in to make them partners that's very invigorating thank you we'll have to do a little race because we don't have too much time but i want to quickly ask all the panelists and uh, just in about 2 minutes vijay when i look at your portfolio you have brilliant entertainment probably among the first indian hotel companies to have thought of that and fnb and now i have seen you take some place else to the geo world mall in bombay and flurries if i see 35 outlets you have doubled it to 70 on track to going to 100 now and i was earlier speaking to vijay you know geo mall even though it's picking up pace his run rate today is about 75 lakhs inching to a crore a month so this is brilliant so how are you looking at both entertainment and fnb to get and drive business to your portfolio so firstly i would say that uh, our business model is uh, or a hotel business model is slightly different uh from that of the other hotel models one is that uh, the customer value uh, which is which always gets created in a typical hotel model is either coming through quality or it's coming through standards or it's coming through product but in our case it's neither it's definitely quality it's definitely standard experiences but there is an added element to it that is entertainment so entertainment in our hotels is distinctly used to create customer value which is different from that of other hotels and when we were passing through the crisis uh, we looked at two brands of or the hotel brands and we thought of that how we can how we can convert this into an opportunity so we looked at taking one of our brands which is some place else out of the hotel portfolio out of the fnb portfolio and we took it out and now we have launched it in in mumbai similarly we have been in this business of uh, bakery and confectionery for close to over 90 years or actually more than 90 years now and uh, it's very difficult to say whether uh, and it's known by the name of flurries so in calcutta it's difficult to say which brand is the more popular brand whether it's flurries or park street or whether it is park hotel or calcutta itself so it's a very powerful brand out of calcutta and we had achieved uh, almost 35 outlets uh, within calcutta or within west bengal so we looked at uh, expanding this brand out because what was happening during the crisis that the qsr segment was doing very well also there was huge demand for for sweets you can say or bakery and confectionery products and this business uh, currently is growing at a rate of at a cagr of 10 to 11% uh, 
It's currently the size of this business is about 16,000 crores and it's expected to be about 25,000 crores over the next four to five years on a rate of 10 to 11 percent. So we looked at this and we thought that let's also uh, take this brand forward. So currently we are now at 70 hotels and we have opened 70 uh, Fluris outlets and uh, we have opened six outlets in Mumbai. And the plan is to take it all over India. It's a pan India plan. We are hopeful that we will be at 100 outlets uh, by, the, by the end of this financial year. Uh, the other key thing about this business, Fluri's business, is that it is it produces industries uh, leading uh, uh, margins. That is something the way we have structured it, the way we have put this whole model together, is to see that we are able to produce industry leading margins in this business. So this is one business which we want to take on a pan India basis. The bar business also, the entertainment business has also been exceedingly uh, successful for, for us. So we have taken it, one of our brands outside the hotel, which is someplace else. In fact, we have many brands like Tantra, we have Roxy, we have Ibar, many of these brands are there. We, we have first taken out someplace else and we uh, hope that we will be there in other metro cities as well. Fantastic. So it's actually looking in-house and taking, you know, what is developed outside, which is a brilliant strategy. A key takeaway, Nikhil, quickly, when you look at the entire Wyndham portfolio, what do you think would be the key learnings, whether it's India or globally, for the hotel sector to be focusing on today? So just a step back and, and the gentleman's walked out of the room. Uh, I think uh, today Wyndham's being hailed as uh, the flag bearers of franchising in this country. And I just want to say uh, the credit is to Mr. K.B. Kashu, who's really the father of hotel franchising, um, and he paved the way. So uh, a lot of our success is because of the path that he created for franchising. He's, he's gone out for a call, but I, I had to say that. I think that's extremely important. Um, I think a, a lot of uh, elements have been spoken of, but I don't think we've spoken enough about sustainability, and it is becoming a commercial tool today. It is not about just doing the right thing. And of course, uh, in Ibrana here, there's a lot of sustainability, but we are now seeing globally customers moving and asking for hotels that are sustainable. And if, if you actually go to Expedia or booking.com, there is today a tab that says, is your hotel sustainable? And, and we are seeing customers clicking. Are they paying higher today? Not currently, but are they becoming more conscious? Yes, so uh, sustainability is the first piece that I think is, is going to be the game changer. The whole sales and marketing approach that we are seeing globally with, with recession and so on and so forth, I believe we are going to see hotels working more closely with OTAs. We are going to see regional sales offices shrinking even further uh, in different cities. If it was Lisbon, London, wherever, I mean, you're going to see that for in the luxury space, you're going to see that in the upscale space. And, and the last piece that I want to speak of is uh, technology, which I think um, hospitality has been, uh, Mr. Kachru is back in the room. So Mr. Kachru, I, I was just saying, thank you for leading the way for franchising in this world as the father of hotel franchising. So thank you. Uh, technology, I think hotels have always been uh, the laggards. Uh, you are going to see more and more technology and the whole discussion of is human, human beings going to be less not really, it's going, to be, it's going to be a mix and match and you're going to enable the customers with technology more and more. And that's here to stay. Thank you, Nikhil. So sustainability and technology, instead of being adjuncts to the business model, need to now get woven into the genetics of the business model. Aman, quickly, with your focus and the fact that, you know, you've never taken external debt, what is special about Nimrana, especially when you look at the domestic travelers? What do you do to A, get them to the property? And what do you do to engage them with the property? That, you know, I have seen, you know, Nimrana people have become like the Aman junkies. You know, so they keep on coming back. So what's the secret sauce? I think there was no premeditated plan on that one. I think, as I said, you stick to your core values, you be honest 
to yourself, you be honest with the client. But um, I think that uh, we created that market for Indians to enjoy Indian heritage. Because when Nimrana opened, 60% uh, of our clients were foreigners and 40 were Indians. And uh, people used to, the Indians used to feel good that they were among foreigners. So they were obviously doing the right thing. But India has changed. And today we have very few complexes. We don't care of who, if we meet this ambassador or that ambassador, we see hello and five minutes later we forget their name, you know. So now Indians are having a ball and the foreigners come and watch us. And they say, how gregarious and fantastic or noisy we are, and they fall in line. So I think that that is wonderful. I think it's not been a conscious we, uh, effort to do this or that, but I think to all of us here that there is really no room for complacence for Indian tourism for with the government or with all of us, you know, with all the statistics and all the facts. I want to remind us that the population of France, this may be a slightly old statistics, about 65 million, and they were getting 92 million tourists, you know. So if we have that kind of ambition, you know, that every village, every child smile, everything in India is marketable. It's not the government is going to do it. They're not going to say village tourism, you know, just send people to a village where there's not even a loo that a lady can forget foreigners. Even an Indian lady can't use a loo in a thing. So that transition will happen when the private sector takes it among themselves, trains the people, makes everybody partners, and we stop feeling that we are the great guys. We have a long way to go, but we are on the springboard. And the leap has happened. So I think we have to spread our arms and fly. Thank you. So the message of Atman Nirbhar Bharat from Aman is not only for the government. The Atman Nirbhar Bharat is for all of us. And to co-opt Indians into that. And wonderful to hear how he's turned his top line from being focused on the foreign traveler to the domestic Indian traveler. Uh, Vikramjeet, I see the red here. but I want to end, but ask you in two minutes. The lemon tree model is like 180 different ratios. During the pandemic, what would have been the top two or three ratios that you felt the company did, you know, a wonderful job shaping and chiseling them better? Okay, so I've got Bhuvnesh staring at me. So I'll try and keep this short here. <laughs> so I'll tell you, you know, there were multiple ratios, there were costs. We looked at everything right from the fact that, you know, we serve in our buffets, we serve mutton worth four crores and we said, do we need to do it? Do we put it on demand? How many people actually consume the mutton to the number of leaves in the writing pad? Do we need a color printout? Do you need a black and white printout to, but the most important, if you ask me, were our manning ratios. So we as a company were at a 0.95, which we brought down to 0.64 and at best case scenario with full with full occupancy, and I say back to pre-COVID, and we did occupancies which were in the mid to late 70s, we will not go beyond 0.66. So that's one ratio, but I'd like to end by saying one thing was, it's not about what we achieved, it's not about what the industry achieved, it's about uh, uh, realizing and understanding and keeping a very close watch on not going back to those previous cost structures. See, we are back, and with success comes complacency. Revenues are back, margins are better, how do you ensure that, you know, we don't go back to the old ratios, the old food costs, the old cost structure. If we do that, then the entire learning is a waste. So, you know, I'd like to end by saying, guys, look at your PNL more minutely. Don't do a postmodern at the end of the month. Look at it literally on a week by week basis. If that, if you lose that edge that we've created for the industry today with the healthiest ever margins, then I think we've lost it all. All learnings are a waste and we are back to zero. Thank you. Vikram, thank you. <clears throat> and I must tell you, I have enjoyed uh, listening to this panel and hearing such varied views back baked in the reality of India. And, and I wish all my co-panelists and their platforms the very best. Thank you very much. Thank you.